Again, good morning everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. We're not going to take a break from John, but we're going to fast forward. <laughs> you know, with it being Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday next week, we move from John chapter 3 to John chapter 12. So if you would this morning, open up your Bibles to John chapter 12. The title of our sermon today is, The King is Coming. And today, we're going to see that the people lined up and they cheered as Jesus entered the city. But the kind of king the people wanted and the kind of king they're going to get are polar opposites. The people, they wanted a king to come and rule and reign and defeat Rome. But the king that's coming that we're going to see is a king that comes in humility. The king that's going to come and give his life a ransom for many. So if you all would, let's all please stand for the reading of God's word. Because God's word is inerrant. God's word is infallible. And God's word is inspired. I'm going to read our entire section this morning. John 12, verses 12 through 19. John writes this. The next day, when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and they went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and said on it, just as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Meanwhile, the crowd which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and had raised him from the dead continued to testify. This is also why the crowd met him, because they heard he had done this sign. Then the Pharisees said to one another, You see? You've accomplished nothing. Look, the world has gone after you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. Lord, we thank you upon this Palm Sunday as we take time to remember that as you entered Jerusalem, you knew exactly what was going to happen. You knew that you were going to go to the cross for my sin and for all sin. Father, thank you. Lord, as we look today at the scriptures and as we prepare our hearts and minds for Easter Sunday, the glorious resurrection, burden our hearts, Father. For it's in the precious and truly holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I promise you I'm not going to go too long, but we're going to have a five-point sermon today. And I've, I've even studied and got the alliteration with the P's. We're going to look at five P's today. The first P is the parade. We see there that the crowds, they came. They wanted to see Jesus come into Jerusalem. They were standing there. They were cheering. They couldn't wait to meet Jesus. The Synoptic Gospels, which you know is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not John, the other three, because they're so similar. They talk about that this possibly was two different crowds that already heard about Jesus. And as the festival started, which again is the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that they're, they're all coming to Jerusalem at the same time to worship. Matthew tells us this in Matthew 21, 9. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed him shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then Mark tells us this. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And if you study those scriptures, like I said, it's actually two different crowds coming together as one. All the Jewish nation was coming to worship at the Passover festival. They were coming looking for the Messiah. Little did they know the Messiah was there. They seen this king entering Jerusalem. But like I said, little did they know this was not the king that they wanted. These crowds 
wanted a true king. They wanted someone who was going to come in and stop the oppression of Rome. They wanted someone to come in and rule and reign with an iron fist and put the Jewish nation back where it belonged. But that was not why Jesus was there that day. The reason Jesus was there that day was that, and that's going to be the key coming, was that prophecy that this Messiah was coming into Jerusalem that day. This Messiah, the anointed one, was coming to put the entire world where it needed to be, not just the Jewish nation. So we see there's this great parade. Jesus is coming in. They're there. So the second thing we have this morning is the praise. We have the parade, and then we have the praise. The people, they were excited, and they cut off palm branches, and they waved them. Palm branches were not associated with the Passover, but were associated with the Feast of Tabernacles. We find that out in Leviticus 23:40. Moses wrote this. On the first day, you are to take the product of majestic trees, palm fronds, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So, if this wasn't meant for the Passover, we're still in the Passover, why were they using palm branches? I'm glad you asked. What we call the intertestamental meaning between the two testaments, between Malachi and Matthew, so it was about 400 years that we don't know a lot about, except from Jewish history. During that intertestamental period, palm branches became a general symbol. And that general symbol was this. It was a symbol of victory and celebration. So although they kind of got it wrong a little bit, the crowd was there, the parade was there, and they were, they were really celebrating the victory. The king is coming. The king is here to rule and reign. As the crowd looked at Jesus to be their new king, they shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. Hosanna, literally from the Hebrew, means help, I pray, or save now, I pray. So they were they were cheering, they were they were cheering this king, help us, save us. But they got it backwards, right? They were wanting help and salvation from Roman rule. This tyranny that forced them and oppressed them. But what they didn't know is that this king was going to help them. This king was going to save them, but not from Rome, but from their sin. They didn't realize that. Do we, as Christians today, realize that we need help? We need salvation. And that salvation comes from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Today, as a church, we need to say, Hosanna, Lord, help us, Lord, save us. The Jewish people would have been very familiar with this because Hosanna was a term that came from a group of psalms known as the Halil, which is Psalms 113 through 118. The Halil was sung each morning by the temple choir during the major Jewish festivals. So they knew about this Hosanna. They knew about this king. The crowd also cried, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Quoting Psalms 118.26. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. From the house of the Lord we bless you. Next, they call Jesus the King of Israel. Matthew also reported this in Matthew 21 9, Matthew 21 15, and Matthew 22 42. And in those verses, we also say they not only call Jesus the King of Israel, they call Jesus the Son of David. They were looking for this Jewish king. Both messianic titles. But they won't truly see Jesus reign as king until his second coming. We have the parade. We have the prophecy. I mean, the praise. Now we have the prophecy. 
Number three, the prophecy. John 12, 14, 15, that we just read, says this. Jesus found a young donkey and said unto him, just as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Church, this is a direct quote from Zechariah 9, 9. Zechariah wrote this, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah prophesied this hundreds of years before Jesus came. The Jewish people were waiting. But there's something different that they didn't realize. Zechariah told them how this king would come riding on a donkey. Church, you may know this, but the donkey is a symbol. It's a symbol of humility. When kings would come out to meet their aggressor, if the king rode upon a donkey, he was coming in peace and in goodwill. But if a king came out on a stallion, on a war horse, the king came out for war. Jesus came on a donkey. He's known as the Prince of Peace. Jesus came to set things right. Jesus came upon a donkey to reconcile humanity back to God this time. But we see in Revelation 1911 that next time Jesus is not coming upon a donkey. Next, listen, Revelation 19.11. Then, John the Revelator writes, I saw heaven opened up, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and makes war. These crowd, this crowd, they didn't realize that Jesus that day was on a donkey, but next time they see Jesus coming, it will be upon a war horse. Jesus is coming to rule and reign and judge the nations. This morning, let me warn you, you will meet Jesus. There's no way around it. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Will you confess your sin to Jesus the humble that died? The Jesus that rode upon the donkey. The Jesus that died to save us from our sin. Or will you bow the second time Jesus comes? When he comes to rule and reign with judgment, the scripture says. I don't know about you, but if it was me, I would rather bow in humility to this king of kings. We're moving along. Next, we see the popularity. Verses 17 through 18. Meanwhile, the crowd which had been with him since he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raising from the dead continued to testify. This is why, this is also why the crowd met him, because they heard he had done the sign. Why did the crowd follow Jesus? Because of he did because of the raising of Lazarus. And because of all the other signs he had done, which we've already covered in John chapter 2. Listen, they followed Jesus with the wrong motives and the wrong heart. The crowd continued to be excited and they began to testify about Jesus. Not that Jesus saves, but that Jesus has these signs, these wonders, these miracles. One thing they were testifying about this here is that Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. And church, I don't know about you, but that's something to talk about, right? This person that has the power of resurrection. And not only that, supreme resurrection becomes the Jewish people. They believe that your soul stayed with you for three days. Guess what Jesus did? Go back and read the story of Lazarus. Jesus purposely waited to the fourth day. So according to Jewish culture and Jewish teaching, the soul had already left Lazarus. But that didn't stop the power of Jesus. 
the one that has power over death, the one that has power over resurrection. This Jesus on the fourth day with a simple command, Lazarus, come forward. Call the dead. So yeah, they were talking about Jesus. They were excited. This is something we've never seen. The fact that they were testifying about Jesus raising Lazarus and Jesus' works shows us this crowd had a superficial faith. I know this was 2,000 years ago, but this is something me and you need to really keep in the back of our minds. Why do we follow Jesus? We have to answer that question, right? Is our faith like this crowd? Is our faith superficial? Do we follow Jesus because of his works and what he can do for us? Or do we truly follow Jesus because of who he is? He is God. He is not only the creator, the sustainer, the savior. That is why we worship Jesus. Again, as I've said multiple times in this sermon, the crowd didn't want a savior to bend the knees to, but a king that would be a political and military ruler to defeat Rome. That's what they wanted. They wanted out of oppression of Rome when they didn't realize that Rome is a minuscule part of the problem. Their problem wasn't Rome. Their problem was sin. The same problem that I have. The same problem that you have. But let's be honest. If Jesus could raise Lazarus from the dead after four days, Jesus could have defeated Rome that easily. If he wanted to. But that wasn't why Jesus came. The Gospels are very clear. Jesus himself said, I come to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus wasn't there to defeat Rome. He's not going to defeat Rome when he comes back. He's going to defeat everybody. The power of Rome is minuscule. Jesus was coming that day on Palm Sunday to seek and save the lost. Jesus is the reason we're here today. He's seeking and saving the lost. So this morning, ask yourself, are you lost? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Not just some historical figure. Because even the scriptures are clear that the demons know who Jesus is. But do you know him as your Savior? Has he plucked those heartstrings? Maybe today's your day of salvation. But the crowds were excited. The crowds were in a frenzy. They were waving the palm branches. So lastly, we have the protest. Verse 19 from today. Then, so after all these things, then the Pharisees said to one another, You see, you've accomplished nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The Pharisees, they saw this scene, and it made them very nervous. Anytime a military power sees the people get excited, the people come together, they get nervous. What the Pharisees wanted that day, listen, they wanted to see Jesus arrested. They wanted to see Jesus brought before trial. They wanted to see Jesus condemned. They wanted to see Jesus crucified. They wanted to see Jesus die. But Jesus was surrounded by thousands and thousands of people. So the Pharisees couldn't act upon it. They realized that the world, the, meaning the people there that day, the world was going after Jesus. It is at this point that the Pharisees realized they must turn the people against Jesus. And with such hostility that the people, listen, 
instead of praising and worshiping, what in turn would happen is they would demand Jesus' execution, which would be the final rejection by the world. The same crowd within one week from screaming, Hosanna, praise be the king, would be screaming, crucify him. Church, this day, we must decide who this Jesus is. This morning, do you need Jesus in your life? I want you to realize that as we go into a time of invitation, you are in one of two categories. You need this king. You need this Jesus. Why? Not, not that some Jesus can do miraculous things and works for you. So that you can have life everlasting. That is why Jesus came. That is why Jesus died. So that I is so that you can have eternal life. This morning, you can probably see the table set up. Every single one of us here need to repent of our sin. Why? Because we all have sin in our lives. Paul is very clear to the Corinthian church. He says, examine yourselves before you take the Lord's side. Now, I'm going to be honest. If we truly, truly examine our lives, examine our hearts, look in that spiritual mirror, there's not a one of us in here that's not a lot of us in We've all fallen short of Paul, one of the great apostles, said that he dies daily to sin. Church, we sin every day. I do, you do well do. Paul said, examine yourselves before you take the Lord's Supper. Also, the Lord's Supper is for believers this morning. So if you're a believer, I hope you protect us. If you're not a believer, my hope, my prayer, is that the next few seconds you come to meet Jesus. Now, I didn't get to do this, but how awesome would it be to, to come to know Jesus and then just a few moments later to take up the Lord's Supper, remembering what Jesus has done for you. You don't have to be a member of Oak Street Baptist Church, but you do have to be a believer. So this morning, do you need Jesus? Are you lost? Do you have unconfessed sin in your life? Tomorrow's not the time. Now is the time when we confess our sin and that we get serious about God. Dear Heavenly Father, as we have the table set before us, let what we do this morning be in remembrance of you.